morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 388 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Thursday, May 23rd, 2024, and it is going to be a gorgeous day here at the Beaver Lodge with the temperatures crossing 20 degrees Celsius and beautiful sun. I am your host, the eager beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfy Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Um, thank you for your patience. A bit of a late start. Just a couple of tech stuff, um, but uh, Mr. Grizzly, um, how's your mental health t- doing t- t- today? Not right, 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 right now. <laughs> not exactly its best right now. Yeah, the fact that's not working correctly. I have to start a, a broadcast in a few minutes, and nothing wants to behave correctly. My phone is almost dead. Uh, I got here later than planned. You know, it's just a, 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 a death by one a leads to another. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. You you look a little stressed. However, may I say that the camera is so damn clear, your eyes are just like literally popping off the screen. Well, when your head is on the screen, that is <laughs> the blue is like really popping. Um, well, I might swap out the camera at home because I have one of these cameras at home and I might give this one a whirl and see if it works better because I've been having problems with the main one that I've been using as of late. And that's a little on the frustrating side because it's supposed to be an AI enabled blah, 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 you know, and uh, for some reason, like yesterday, my jacket was blue, but it looked black. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Technology. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ah, kids and cubs, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's see who's in the chat. Uh, good morning, Kit, Mr. Jim, Kit, Michael, lovely to see you, Kit, Toronto, Dan, Kit, Cassie, Kit, Crazy Cheech. Hey, that's a name I don't recognize. So if you're new to us, welcome. Kit Elaine, Kit Argosi Acres, hello. Uh, how else do we have here? Kit Saucy Sea Witch, of course, Kit Mohan. And uh, hopefully the rest of the family is there as well. Good morning to you all. Um, have I missed anybody here early on? I think that's everyone. So, uh, oh, Kit Linda M, hello, dear. Thank you so much. And Kit Tavi G. There you go. I think I managed to get everyone, unless somebody's going to pop in at the last minute to get a hello here. Ah, Kit Jason. Uh, I think this is a new name, Jason Alley. So uh, welcome if you're new here. Kit Mr. Cal saying good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Crazy Cheech as I pop in every once in a while. Well, we're glad that today is one of those every once in a while. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, Kits and Cubs. Uh, 
big news uh, in politics is actually not national uh, today, but international. Because um, out of seemingly out of the blue, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Rishi Sunak, announced that uh, they were going to the polls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was so, a bit of a surprise, eh? Yeah, in about six weeks. Uh, I believe that uh, according to the law, uh, they had, I think, a, uh, I think they were able, they had the right to go some, up until sometime next year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, yeah, they're uh, they're going to go to the polls on uh, July fourth. So same day as uh, Independence Day in the United States. Um, he doesn't have to call an election now, uh, but he's taking a gamble because apparently he has some um, the most positive economic numbers that there have been in a while. So I'm guessing he thinks, why not Certainly now I'm rather not. than maybe something later? But I mean, yeah, this is a, for all intents and purposes, unless something really happens, uh, this is a change election. Um, so he says, uh, I spoke with his majesty, the king to request the dissolution and the king has granted this request. We will have a general election on the 4th of July because he had, until the king. that's, that's a weird thing to hear. You know, I mean, I know my I know. life it was a queen and now it's a king. And yeah, I know. I don't think Same. I'll ever get used to that, to be honest with you. Same here. It'll be weird. Um, so he had until January next year to call the vote, but he chose a summer election, hoping to capitalize on positive economic news uh, and progress in his attempts to subdue illegal immigration. Uh, speaking outside Downing, Downing Street, uh, Rishi Sunak portrayed himself as a dependable leader at an uncertain time. Quote, only a conservative government led by me will not put our hard-earned economic stability at risk. Um, why he's saying that is if you remember when uh, Liz Truss uh, became prime minister for a while and uh, did not allow the lettuce um she come up she came up with a whole suite of uh, economic policies that uh, basically sent um, the uk stock market into a tailspin and uh, mm -hmm. had uh, international markets reacting uh similarly enough that was probably the same plan that pierre Polyev had planned for us but since uh, uh, the uk is in a worse economic state than we are um, they didn't have the buffer for the, the international markets to be able to say, well, you know, they'll, they'll take a hit, but they'll be able to, to weather that hit. Um, and then uh, she was bounced and uh, he came in and uh, he did, to give him the credit, he did bring, uh, bring back a semblance of stability mm -hmm. uh, in, in that sense. Or, or so, um, But the party has been in power for 14 years. And, uh, I mean, it's been chaos. Yeah, it's not been a good 14 years of leadership, if you ask me personally. And I think there's a lot of Britons that would agree with that. Maybe I mean, for a party change? Yeah, yeah. It all started with David Cameron with his uh, Brexit gamble, and we all know how that turned out. Yeah, well, that was Nigel Farage and the UK Independent Party that pushed that uh, agenda. Yep. And agenda. largely racist agenda, by yep. the way. Yep. And screwed over Scotland. Oh, yeah, yeah. Scotland voted to stay within the UK. and, and, and Assuming they that they would remain in, in, in Europe. Yeah. So now Scotland's looking to join Canada, which I think is kind of... It, it puts a smile on my face. Uh, because, I mean, realistically, what... What do they have to offer other than sheep, some good culture, and whiskey? And I don't mean that as a slight against Scotland, but what are you bringing to the party is what I'm asking. Hmm. And I, I don't, I don't know that it would be. I'm not, I'm not against it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against it at all. I'm actually kind of for it, but I don't know how it would benefit both our nation. I, it would be a benefit to Scotland. Would it be a benefit to Canada? Is the question. And you have to ask that when you're looking at, you know, altering your uh, geographic landscape. I'm looking that up on the web because I had never heard that. But it apparently, was there was a lot of talk of it in 2017. Was mm -hmm. there recent talk about it? No, not not okay. recently. But it was okay. 2017, uh, yeah. and then 
that was during the time of Brexit. And then, of course, you know, yeah, it was a and, Canadian writer, Ken McGugan, who thought that Canada should invite Scotland to become its 11th province. Yeah. And I know that there was a lot of people in Scotland that were amenable to that idea. Nothing really became of it because at the time it was like, well, what do you bring to the party? Hmm. Hmm. What can you contribute? And again, like I said, That'd sure, uh, whiskey, sheep, some wonderful culture, some great swearing. <laughs> but, but you know, uh, how is it going to uh, benefit Canadians? Now, Scotland is a, a relatively uh, small population. Was it eight, seven, eight million? Uh, I don't think it's, I will look that up. Yeah, if you could, it's not that big. So, you know, it could certainly add to Canada's population, and their culture Five. would remain intact. Five million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, exactly. yeah. Population twenty two was five point four three six million. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. So I mean, that's the size. It's a little bit bigger than Alberta. It's about the size of British Columbia, hmm. population wise. So could could we absorb that kind of uh, numbers? I'm sure we could. Uh, oh yeah. But uh, I know, mean, it's uh, not like it's not like it's not a developed place. It, it, undeveloped, you mean? It's not. Okay. An yeah, we could we could turn it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's not a developed place or it's an undeveloped place. Yes, I mean, yeah. like the the question is though, to, if they were to do something like that, uh, would they adopt our currency? Probably not, because it wouldn't be their benefit to their benefit there. Right. Same with Turks and Caicos; they mostly use the U.S. dollar, and they've been wanting to join us for a very long time. They insist on still using the U.S. dollar, and I'm like, well can't say I would argue with you in that sentiment, but, you know, how do those things get worked out? And I'm not an economist, uh, nor am I a geopolitician. So <laughs> I like the idea of both of those things in, in having both of those countries join Canada as additional provinces or territories, but I don't know exactly how it would work. Right, right. Same here. Don't know the first thing about that type of stuff. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to uh, an election early in the UK, which is kind of interesting. Uh, like I said, it looks pretty much uh, like Keir Starmer and uh, the Labour Party are going to win and that there will be a change of government. Uh, but again, it's how you get there. Uh, that's going to matter. It seems that uh, where uh, the Labour Party is concerned is that uh, they've not... Uh, not been taking as clear policies on things as they could have, uh, playing it vague. But now that they're going to get into an election, they're going to have to make some decisions, which is going to, uh, you know, maybe cause uh, some jockeying of subtype. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's nothing that unites people in politics like the prospect of power uh, and impending power. So it could very well be that, uh, you know, everybody's able to get along because, well, you know, they feel that they have this one in the bag uh, to start with. So um, it'll be interesting to see how, how it uh, goes. It, now, as soon as this news uh, came out, uh, there was also some other news that it seems that while Rishi Sunak has decided to call an election, uh, there are some people in the UK um, who would, uh, within the party, who do not want <laughs> to go into an election right away, and that there is a movement within the party. Now, how serious and how... Um, uh, coordinated and disciplined it is going to be is going to be a question but according to politics uk uh so 14 hours ago so basically you know sunak made the announcement and then if, i'm not sure how long later but it wasn't that long later breaking tory mps are working on a plot tonight to call off the general election by replacing Rishi Sunak before Parliament is dissolved next Thursday. Several letters of no confidence are going into the 1922 committee. I'm not familiar enough with British politics to know what the 1922 committee is, unfortunately. Uh, from the very latest 
uh, a Tory MP is quoted as saying, today has clearly been an absolute disaster, but the election is not irrevocable. Up until the point of the dissolution of Parliament, when the writs are moved to begin the contests, it can still be aborted. And again, I stop and muse at the irony of something that a conservative is actually willing to abort. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, an instant like what the hell? So I'm guessing there's some people in uh, the party that was rel that were relatively blind sighted as a result of this. Um, as a result of the SNAP election, uh, Rishi Sunak's anti-smoking legislation has been officially ditched. Uh, Rishi Sunak uh, wanted to make the UK the first country in the world uh, where people under a certain age uh, would not be able to uh, legally purchase cigarettes. And then over time, that would make the UK uh, the first smoke-free country. Uh, so it seems that that's not doing it. It seems that uh, Nigel Farage has also... Uh, announced that he is quitting his new show during the election in order to campaign for Reform UK. Um, there was a press conference uh, from the Reform Party UK, it seems, uh, that just ended an hour ago. I'm not sure what it was about. I'm just following here what's on the, the Politics UK site to see if there's any more here with regard to, to the move to... Um, uh, try to counteract that. But let's just put it this way. They know that they are not going to win. And when you know you're not going to win, when you go into an election, it becomes a save the furniture operation. And um, sometimes people roll, everybody rolls in the same direction as the team when that happens. And sometimes uh, you just go into it pointing fingers. <laughs> and blaming each other. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people that are not happy. Either they're not happy that they're going now or either, either they're not happy that um, they don't uh, get to be a part of the system all the way up until January, that the, the ride ends a little earlier than they had expected and they're just not ready to let it go yet. I don't know. But uh, when between the time you ask for an election to be called and you actually dissolve parliament, there starts to be mutiny within the party, uh, it's probably not going to be a good election for you. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, has announced, confirmed, to, well, confirmed today, apparently, that he will be standing as an independent candidate in the electoral district of Islington North. Um, Jeremy Corbyn, I believe, was the leader of the Labour Party before Keir Starmer was. And uh, at one point, people thought that he had a good chance of becoming prime minister, and I think he had completely blown it um, during a campaign or in the lead up to a campaign. And I guess he got replaced. So <laughs> uh, but he is going to uh, still uh, run. Uh, Keir Starmer has already had a first election rally. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so the, they're, they're off to the races. Uh, Rishi Sunak is in Derby this morning as he kicks off a tour of the UK. So the, there are the parliament hasn't even dissolved officially yet, and uh, they are already in a full campaign mode here. So, um, yeah, we'll see what it is. Uh, and, of course, um, the other controversial thing uh, in the UK right now is that... Uh, uh, with regards to an uh, immigration, um, they have uh, passed a law where they're going to uh, uh, take people that come to the UK to immigrate and then ship them off to Rwanda to wait to be processed. Uh, and um, that, uh, uh, all of that um, went to the courts and uh, were dealt with in that sense because some people tried to block that policy. Uh, from happening. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what it is that the courts had ultimately decided, but I'm guessing that it looks like the policy was able to go ahead in some format. Um, Shipping them off to Rwanda? Yep. <sighs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, that he, he's basically already pledged, if you elect me, if I'm Prime Minister on July 5th, those flights will go off to Rwanda. Richie Sunak is. 
Hmm. Yeah, I know. According here, UK plan. So, so what is it here? There we go. On April 14th, 2022, the UK government shared their new plan called the Nationality and Borders Bill to stop asylum seekers from coming to live in England. Um, the government has decided to send asylum seekers traveling by boat to the UK from France to Rwanda instead. Specifically, they say that this will cost the UK 120 million pounds, but that it will save money in the long term. The government has decided to see if this stops people from trying to travel to the UK in dangerous ways for the next five years. They believe too many people are trying to enter the UK by crossing the English Channel in boats, and many have drowned or have needed rescuing. Last year, 20,500. at all. That's stupid. No, no. It's stupid. No. Like the death penalty. It doesn't deter people from doing bad things. This is not going to deter people from trying to reach a better life. This is stupid. Sorry. I'm just, I can't believe how ridiculous this is. Yep. Anybody uh, with a shred of thought in their head would know that this won't work. And this is just appeasing a certain specific group of people. This is action for it, action's sake. That's all it is. It's not doing a damn thing. Yeah. Now, the, this, this is data from 2022 that I'm reading here. Last year, 28,526 people made the crossing from France to the UK, up from 8,466 in 2020. So um, that, that was a big jump from 2020 to 2021. That's uh, mm -hmm. at least threefold. So 300% jump at least. Uh, and at the moment, back then, 2022, uh, only asylum seekers who are men traveling alone were going to be sent to Rwanda. Uh, people are uh, concerned about this because they said it opens the door into uh, uh, human trafficking and people smuggling. Uh, it, it creates a situation if men who are traveling alone know that they're going to send back, it creates a situation where people smugglers are going to try to convince women and children to travel with the men. Mm -hmm. Men that they don't know. So, yeah. Yeah. Not gonna uh, yeah. Some, pe some people have made the argument that uh, the plan will only house about 100 asylum seekers, and anyway, it would be cheaper to just pay for them to stay at the Ritz than to send yeah. them to Rwanda. And if that was the case, once again, proving that when it comes to treating people poorly or keeping them down, there is no limit to what a conservative will spend. It's not about the money. Never has been. They tell you it's about the money. It's not. Lawyers have said, yeah, lawyers have said that policy breaks the UN Refugee Convention and the European Convention on Human Rights, and they were trying to stop uh, stop it from becoming law. And uh, like I said, uh, the courts then therefore ruled, and I guess allowed that it could still happen under circumstance, certain circumstances, and uh, and it is, and now it's a campaign issue. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we have a situation where we have a guy who looks like Rishi Sunak um, standing in front of a microphone saying, yeah, I'm going to send those people off to Rwanda. Vote for me. Yeah. And yesterday, hey, and yesterday we found out that the president of the Dominican Republic built a wall. Oh, along the Haitian border? Yeah. I didn't know this. Yeah, yesterday, because you know the, the Kenyan forces have started to arrive in, the, or are going to start to arrive in Haiti, um, and uh, but there's been a lot of migrants from Haiti looking to cross, you know, to cross the river and the bridge into the Dominican Republic, and uh, they just had an election uh, like this, and their incumbent president was uh, put in place, uh, was re-elected, re um, but it was the popularity of his immigration policies. He actually he actually built a wall. Wow. Yeah. Now, of course, he didn't have a, a wall as long to build. <laughs> no. Would have had one too, but he no. actually said it and did it. Well, and, and there is, I mean, Haiti is a, uh, Haiti is a, it's a completely lawless state at the moment. Totally lawless. Totally lawless. There's no form of government. It's run, the, the nation is run by gangs. So, 
Yeah, I mean, greater than 2,500 people have been killed or injured in the first three months of 2024 in Haiti. So, I mean, really, should we get horribly upset by this? No, I think he's doing it. For, he, he's doing it for, to, to protect his people. Yeah, it's not, it, it's not a. Uh, but we're building walls. Yeah, which we hate to see. I, I, I understand this. I understand why it's being done. I don't necessarily disagree with it, but it, it's it's not the direction we want to be going in. But until Haiti can, you know, start to self-govern which I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon because I've had friends who've served there and said of all the places they served in the world, that was the one place they didn't want to go back to. He says, because there's nothing we can do to change it. They don't want us there and we can't change it. Right. So I don't know. Uh, I have, I have friends from Haiti who have family there and I'm, I'm worried for them right now. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you remember there was, wasn't that many years ago, they had a devastating earthquake. Well, th that's that's the thing that they're talking about the news. So they're saying that the humanitarian crisis in Haiti right right now is the worst since the 2010 earthquake. There you it's go. that bad. Uh, so that was uh, Jean Martin Bauer, who's the head of the food program in Haiti, uh, confirming that uh, workers uh, with the United Nations food ground food program are on the ground in the capital, which is uh, one of the good things. Uh, CBC News is actually one of the few New York news organizations in the entire world that has got been given permission to enter the capital of Paro Prince to provide some coverage. So once again, uh, Kits and Cubs, when we're talking about a reason for which we shouldn't uh, dismantle the CBC, there's yes. one. Sometimes yeah. they're trusted internationally as being one of the only news organizations mm -hmm. that they led into a certain area so that we can get coverage. Very true. Very true. Uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Grizzly, gangs control most of the capital. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, kidnappings, rapes, and killings are rampant, and the country has been without a functioning government for a long time. Residents have set up anti-gang block blockades in order to try to protect themselves. Uh, mothers have been sleeping in open air with their children wow. because they've lost their homes to gangs. Uh, it, it's it's really, really, really bad. Uh, as bad as we, Yeah. Yeah, as we, so uh, as we mentioned, a delegation of Kenyan officials had arrived in Paro Prince and a multinational police force is, should be landing within a day to help Haitian police in the capital begin to restore order. U.S. cargo jets have been delivering military equipment to the Paro Prince airport for weeks, and the Kenyans will be inspecting all of it. Uh, last, uh, and then um, the president of Kenya, um, William Ruto, had arrived uh, in Washington, D.C., and uh, apparently to a state dinner, and apparently he is the first African leader to have been greeted at the White House in about 20 years. How is that possible? How is that possible that not one African leader, leader of an African nation in the last 20 years, has rated enough to go visit the White House? Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. That's just really weird. You you can't just let that. You got the meeting invite. Oh yeah. It's you can't just um. How would I put it? Allow an entire continent to not get any attention for twenty years. Like whoever was in charge of f foreign policy there, really screwed that up. Um, but yes. Welcomed uh, to the White House, and uh, there was a state dinner for uh, William Ruto. Uh, and it seems that uh, in addition to that, um, how would you put it? Uh, the, um, the government of Kenya is being elevated uh, within the sphere of uh, the United States. Um, they're being considered... Um, now as a strategic uh, non-NATO non affiliated strategic military partner. Uh, and that's a change in the status. So this is a, in that, um, in that realm, in that world, that's a very, 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 very big deal uh, to change that. So um, yeah, it seems that there's uh, some rapprochement. I know that the United States uh, has been on uh, how would I put it? Um, 
has realized a few years ago that it had dropped the ball in Africa and is trying uh, to regain its its foothold diplomatically by doing a couple of things, and this might be one. Uh, Kit Michael asks, I don't understand the relationship between Haiti and Kenya. Uh, I'm not sure that there is one specifically, um, but I know that when we're bringing in uh, types of police forces to help like they're doing now, um, they do try to bring in people as much as possible that look like uh, the people um, who are trying to be protected. So I'm guessing that uh, everybody assumed uh, that uh, everybody being black uh, might be the best, the best way to go. That's why a lot of the member nations that are going to be parts of the police forces uh, coming from the Bahamas and Jamaica and other nations um i think that there's a because of the colonial past there's a very concerted effort to try and have as few white faces uh, as possible um and then of course yes the for the french language uh, as well if uh, that is possible to do that i'm not sure uh, that french is a a language uh that is very strong in Kenya because it's a Commonwealth country. Um, but, uh, but yeah, exactly. Uh, Djibouti president. Oh, there we go. Okay. We got, uh, see, I, I thought that was wrong. We got a kit H a, which a, a new kit. Uh, I've never heard from you before in the chat. So thank you very much. Says the president of Djibouti was invited to the white house under Obama. So, uh, there you go. So, uh, I think, uh, some people may have had their facts wrong there. Um, but yeah, that's about the, the only thing I could uh, see uh, with, with regard to uh, Haiti. Um, had it been a country like Senegal, for example, uh, then of course the, the French uh, aspect, would have, you could, we could have layered that on. Um, but Kenya is, uh, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, out of the 50, uh, slightly greater than 50 countries on the African continent, that uh, Kenya is um, uh, one of the more uh, developed and influential nations uh, on the continent and therefore also probably was one of the uh, nations that had the best capacity to be able to take on uh, this type of project. Um, so that's my best guess. Uh, I do not actually know this for 100% sure that these were the reasons, but I do know for a fact um, that uh, Kenyan is a, a Commonwealth country and that uh, in these types of missions, they try to uh, um, have people that look a lot more like the people there um, uh, that, that are being tried to protect and they try to, uh, uh, exactly, they're Cassie, like Kenya is one of the most political stable countries uh, on the continent as well. So there we go. Yes, yes, Kitsasi, we pretty much all need to brush up on our knowledge of African history. <laughs> but it's, it is not, let's just put it this way, if I was playing Jeopardy and that category came up, I would be probably trying to avoid it. <laughs> or saving it for last. <laughs> it's not, it's not my strong, strongest uh, suit either. Um, but yes, um, all of this is happening there, and it, there'll be a lot of movement, but it seems that things are moving uh, moving ahead there. And uh, hopefully there'll be a... Uh, hopefully we'll, 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 see, we'll see some change. We'll, have, we'll see some change that's coming there. Um, also, a country we don't talk about uh, a lot, but since we're talking about where there's uh, unrest, uh, there's a country in the, the Pacific... Um, around uh, Australia and all of that, uh, that sort of general area of the globe called uh, New Caledonia. Uh, and it, uh, it, it was a, a, a French territory um, that's associated with France. And there's been some violence there because the government of France has passed a law granting voting rights uh, in provincial elections to French nationals. And that has really upset the indigenous population of New Caledonia because, uh, well, they think that uh, these are laws that are uh, designed to favor the white colonial, colonialist nation uh, as a part, uh, instead of uh, the, um, the, the traditional peoples uh, and uh, residents of the island. So um, 
French President Emmanuel Macron uh, says that dialogue is the way out of the violence in New Caledonia. He says it's his responsibility to forge that path in the French territory, but he says that French forces will remain on the Pacific Island for as long as necessary. Um, he is uh, making a trip to New Caledonia, and that uh, trip will come is coming after days of a violent unrest. Um, six people have been killed, vehicles have been burned, looting began last week. Um, indigenous leaders say that allowing more French nationals to vote in provincial elections will undermine their ability to govern their own people. Um, so, uh, yes, there's, uh, the capital of New Caledonia is Noumea, uh, N-O-U-M-E, accent aigu, uh, like, like as in cafe with a, a and an A at the end. And it's, um, it's a country we don't, uh, it's a territory we don't hear much about, uh, but it's a, it's relatively, uh, big, uh, geographically size, geographically size. Like if we're thinking, uh, you know, when we look at the Caribbean and, uh, we think of, uh, Cuba and Jamaica, they're, uh, they're relatively, uh, big islands, uh, in there. So, uh, New Caledonia is a relatively big island, but it is in the, the South Pacific area. And uh, we, uh, we don't hear about it very much, but it is, uh, like I said, uh, uh, in the, the history with uh, France and whatnot, it was one of the places that uh, for France was uh, uh, in charge of back and then. Uh, it consists of about a dozen islands in the South Pacific. It's known for its palm-lined beaches and marine life-rich lagoons. Uh, and it has one of the world's largest lagoons at 24,000 square kilometers. A massive barrier reef surrounds the main island. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's one of those, uh, it's a nice destination as well for travel, you know, sort of like Tahiti and uh, that, uh, that type of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a country we don't hear, uh, hear a lot about and uh, we don't... Uh, um, I've always known it's, I personally have always known it existed because I've always had a fascination uh, with that part of the world when I was a kid. Um, I had wanderlust really big, really bad, and I wanted to go to the place that the places that were as far away as possible. So I was fascinated with Indonesia and Australia and New Zealand and all of that. And while I was researching that, then that's, that's when I heard about countries like, you know, Vanuatu and, uh, and all of those, you know, those little, little nations, uh, island nations, Tonga. And uh, that type of stuff. So that's how I stumbled upon uh, New Caledonia. Uh, but if you look at it on a on a map, uh, it's in the, the oh, well in the ocean, of course. But it's to the right uh, of Australia, um, between Australia and New Zealand, uh, high up uh, in northern Australia, to the right of it. And uh, yeah, so that's where you you can find it. Uh, it was. Um, so yeah, so I would put it. So, you, so and the French association with that island has existed right since, uh, like around the eighteen fifties. So yeah, they uh, they have a, a long-standing um, uh, relationship there. So yeah, uh, violence. Uh, Macron is going to try and solve it. So uh, yeah, there's lots of these uh, little uh, things that are happening in little nations and little fires that uh, people are going uh, to try and uh, um, calm down and temper to hopefully uh, um, my guess is that worldwide people are thinking that you know with what's going on in Israel and what's going on in Ukraine, uh, that's more than enough war. Thank you. We really don't need to, uh, <laughs> we really don't need to be starting skirmishes anywhere else. There we go. Yes, Mademoiselle Fox, thank you. The, the indigenous, indigenous group in New Caledonia are called the Kanak. Um, so th thank you for bringing that bit of knowledge. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was, uh, uh, I was looking for that, actually scanning the, <laughs> the articles to, to find the name of the people specifically. So I'm glad you had it, uh, Mademoiselle Fox. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, so there we go. That's a whole bunch of stuff uh, that is going on uh, worldwide. Uh, the other little worldwide thing that's going on is uh, um, there's been a new leader uh, elected in Taiwan not too long ago, 
and uh, upon being elected, um, he made a statement that, you know, um, he's going to defend the territory and that, you know, China should, you know, pump its brakes on all the things that it does because China has been uh, very, very, very upset with a lot of people recognizing Taiwan a little more. Of course, the world has kind of been goading China in a way by sending delegations there. Um, but uh, it seems, uh, you know, a delegation is sent and then the China decides to run some military exercises, you know, to intimidate and that type of stuff. And, you know, they say that that's punishment for you, you know, for having, you know, Taiwan for having allowed people to come in and, you know, daring to portray yourself as some type of a nation on the world stage. Um, but uh, Beijing has been, uh, since the election of the new leader, Beijing has been conducting drills. Uh, but these ones are different because the exercises are simulating for the first time a full-scale attack of Taiwan by air and by sea. And it's just been three days since the inauguration of the new president of Taiwan, uh, William Lai, which Beijing uh, describes as a, quote, dangerous troublemaker. Uh, so China calls these drills strong punishment for separatist acts. Um, the war games are being condemned by Taipei. Uh, Japan and South Korea are among those calling for regional peace and security to be protected. Uh, Australia's foreign minister call, is calling the drills deeply worrying and is concerned that the situation could escalate. Beijing, of course, uh, considers Taiwan to be part of its uh, territory. So that's uh, those are some things going on. So like just these little skirmishes going on here and there. Uh, a lot of people don't want to to be a uh, to grow into bigger things. So people are uh, trying to take some uh, some action. Uh, but as we mentioned, uh, kids and cubs. Uh, you know, again, new leader in uh, Taiwan elections in um, in the UK. The president stepped down in Haiti. Um, you know, uh, there's a presidential election going on right now in Mexico. Um, I think they're going to the polls on June 2nd. And for the first time in Mexicans in Mexico's history, they will have a female president when it's all done. Um, because the two main candidates are, uh, female, the two top leaders, um, uh, in the polls going into the party. And one of them happens to be indigenous, which is also a first and also a first, the other, uh, woman who is, and who she was the front runner is actually of Jewish heritage. So, uh, this is a complete sea change for Mexico. Uh, Mexico has never had a female, uh, prime minister at all. And it's not necessarily a nation that has a reputation of being very, opening open and welcome uh to female leaders so um so that uh, the two main containers are female and then that one is indigenous and then the other one is jewish jewish um that's a it's a <laughs> moment in mexico but that's how the world is changing, right? We were talking yesterday how the new leader of the Dominican Republic is someone who's of Lebanese an ancestry so uh, you know we're at the stage now where uh, immigration and migration has happened enough throughout the world that, you know, we have uh, uh, countries are having different types of leaders. Rishi Sunak in the United, in the UK, right? So, um, yeah, uh, Kit Michael said, yeah, one of the Mexican party leaders has suspended their campaign after the tragedy yesterday. Yes, uh, that did happen. I, I do have a video of it, but I, I'd have to have Mr. Grizzly uh, on for it. But uh, yes, during the campaign uh, yesterday in Mexico, uh, there was a very, very tragic uh, event that happened. Uh, I believe uh, it was a uh, not one of the two main candidates, but uh, a man whose first name is Jorge, and I can't remember his last names. Oh, darn. And I did write it down somewhere. Um, but yes, uh, he was at a, a campaign rally, and... Uh, People were on stage and they were chanting, uh, as you do in a rally. And then just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this sudden gale force wind just popped up and blew the stage pretty much to smithereens. Um, and when you see the video, it's really, really dramatic. It's like the, the stage just gets lifted up and, uh, crushed. Jorge Alvarez Menez. Uh, thank you, uh, 
uh, kit Mr. Jim for that one. Um, yeah, they got uh, crushed. I believe that a, a child of, of six died um, during the, the event. And I believe that uh, about 50 people uh, were injured. Um, so the yes, the, that particular uh, candidate had suspended his campaign. Nine dead uh, as of one hour ago. Now uh, it's nine dead and fifty-four injured. Uh, that so um, yeah, that's going to be a a big story to follow. Uh, I'm sorry, I do not know what's happening, but it seems that I have frozen. Can can people still hear me? Just wondering. All right. Well, things seem to have been reverted to normal, so hopefully you can still hear me. You'll give me a give me a thumbs up, kids and cubs. Uh, there we go. So yes, uh, at the event, uh, so the candidate was not injured in the incident, which happened during his campaign event in the northeastern city of San Pedro Garza Garcia. Uh, the governor of Mexico's Nuevo León state said at least fifty four people were injured, and rescue operations were ongoing to save some of the people trapped under the collapse stage. Um, quote, uh, Governor Samuel Garcia Sepulveda said in a post on X, quote, what we experienced happened in just a few seconds. A gale came, a sudden wind, and unfortunately it collapsed the stage, resulting in a fatal accident. I, uh, Alvarez Menez told Reuters, I first saw the musicians' drums from the group that was going to play were going to get blown away. When the others noticed, they ran in different directions. Some jumped to the sides of the stage, and I jumped back. Um... Footage taken in the aftermath of the accident shows a large number of emergency vehicles at the scene, their lights flashing in the darkness as injured people are carried away. The area was cordoned off and guarded by heavily armed security personnel. Nearby observations from Monterey show there were thunderstorms that brought gusty winds to at least 40 to 50 kilometers an hour. The stage location was likely impacted by a gust front, which is when gusty winds suddenly pick up and change direction from nearby thunderstorms. Uh, my Alvarez Menez said he was suspending all campaign activities after the collapse, but will remain in the state to monitor the situation and victims. Quote, we have to have solidarity. There's nothing that can repair an accident, a damage of this nature, and people will not be alone in this tragedy and through the consequences that this tragedy will have in their lives. Uh, he's a congressman representing the center-left citizens movement party. He has little chance of winning the presidency, um, but uh, speaking to reporters, uh, he said that he had. Uh, he said that the civil defense teams had to check the structure of the set prior to the event, but that the severity of the wind gusts had caught the organizers by surprise. Uh, yeah, there we go, there we go. And uh, with regard to the election in Mexico, uh, the, the candidate. Uh, it's a big deal there. Uh, there's a, a st estimated 70,000 candidates that have stepped forward to compete for more than 20,000 positions, including the national presidency and the governorships of nine states. Uh, and then uh, because uh, um, uh, Mexico is uh, emerging uh, as, a, as a democracy, um, so far this year, at least 28 candidates have been attacked so there has been some violence with 16 killed, according to the, to data through April 1st from the research group Data, data Civica. So um, this is, a, according to them, a figure set to outpace even the bloodiest election cycles in Mexico's past. So um, it's a, you know, they are, um, with NAFTA too and being brought more in to the sort of a North American trade zone, um, Mexico has been making a lot of changes over the past few years, past few decades. Before, like for example, their legal system used to be uh, more uh, guilty until proven innocent, rather than innocent and proven guilty, and that's a change that they've made uh, in recent years and that type of stuff to to help integrate. So, um, you know, while Mexico, in some ways, is becoming more progressive, as you know, evidenced by the candidates in this election, um, there's still um, it still hasn't completely left um, its past behind with regard to some unrest, that type of stuff. But it is, with every um, 
every passing year, every passing decade, it is, it, it, it is, and it seems to be uh, the case regardless of who the leader is, um, trying to make uh, take steps towards um, integrating more with North America uh, as being a power uh, because you know in a few years there are there's a lot more people in Mexico than there are in Canada, and uh, right uh, Mexico has definitely the potential to uh, become uh, a much bigger player on the international stage with a much bigger economy. Um, you know, they have the, they have the, the people, they have the resources, they have uh, uh, the, the democratic system and the education system that allows for it. So um, it's a country that, uh, that's very attractive for a lot of people because the growth potential there is huge. So um, more and more and more when we're going to be talking, uh, you know, we've had NAFTA for a long time now, um, but Canada never really paid attention all that much to developing its relationship with Mexico until uh, Trump became uh, the president. And then NAFTA too was being renegotiated and then all of a sudden Canada realized, hey, you know what? Maybe having better and deeper relationships with Mexico than we do uh, can actually help us when something like this happens, because there are three parties in this agreement. So, um, yeah, this was a. Uh, you're, I think you're going to see over the next year, next few years, and decades, um, Canada and Mexico um, definitely um, getting closer, uh, because on certain issues. Uh, we're probably more aligned than uh, we are with the United States, particularly when we get a Republican uh, leader that decides that uh, they want to go on a bit of a, uh, a buy America or America first bent, then uh, it's always good to have an ally in the corner. <laughs> so these are ties that uh, we should see uh, deepening as the years go by. All right. What else do we have for you today, uh, Kits and Cubs? Um, this is a little tricky. I have to say, Kits and Cubs, uh, and by the way, thank you yesterday for all the kind comments that you gave uh, in terms of uh, me hosting the show and uh, for all intents and purposes doing it solo because Mr. Grizzly is busy, as is the case today. Um, I know that the show is way more interesting, um, but Mr. Grizzly and I have an opportunity to go back and forth and sometimes, of course, when Mr. Grizzly is talking, uh, that allows me to prepare my next segment uh, so I don't uh, look like I'm uh, uh, searching and scanning and uh, stumbling a bit. Um, so, it, uh, of course, adapting on the fly because uh, uh, things that for which uh, have uh, video and images, uh, because Mr. Grizzly is not here to put them up on the screen, I'm not able to, to show them to you. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of an interesting workaround. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, to be totally honest, it's not my most comfortable way to do this. Uh, I feel much more comfortable uh, when Mr. Grizzly is here. And uh, of course, Mr. Grizzly says the same thing when he has to do it alone every now and then. Uh, he feels more comfortable when I'm here. It, it's, it just doesn't feel the same just doesn't feel the same. Uh, uh, I like my buddy. What can I say? I think the show is better with my buddy. <laughs> but the show must go on because the news doesn't stop. And uh, the kids uh, do not, uh, do not uh, demand being less informed. Right? Right? Right. <laughs> uh, okay so let's see what we have else here for you um okay that's the haiti stuff i went through that oh yes um it seems that uh when we're, we've been talking a lot about cell phone service uh and uh, fees going down, the government keeps on making the claim, and it is backed up by Statistics Canada, that the cost of cell phone, cell phone plans uh, have gone down. Now, and the conservatives say, well, have you seen your cell phone plan go down? And it's like, no. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people now who might be paying the same amount, but getting a lot more for the money uh, that they have. So in terms of, uh, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how it is that they make the calculation, but I know 
that if Statistics Canada is saying that I can trust it. So um, the cost of cell services have gone down overall, um, but competition is a factor. And it seems that uh, there was a telecom deal struck between Loblaws and a company that's owned by Bell & Rogers uh, that has uh, created a situation that is a little tricky for a Quebec media company. So um, uh, the hedge, the, how would I put it? The head of this company is appealing to Canada's industry minister uh, because uh, the deal between Loblaws and Rogers has pushed this company out of its telecom kiosks uh, um, in their stores that are, uh, yeah, basically they they have, you know, when you go to a shopping mall and you see those little kiosks like this where you can get to, you know, sign up for a cell plan or, you know, do different things, uh, upgrade your phone or buy equipment for your phone. Um, that is going to happen. The, uh, those places, Loblaws is going to kick out this company. So uh, it's Freedom Mobile and the CEO, Pierre Calpelado. And if that uh, name rings a bell for you, uh, it should because uh, Pierre Calpelado is a... Uh, um, with Quebec Art and Vidéotron and uh, all of those companies. Uh, and uh, once uh, had a dalliance in politics, he tried to run as a uh, far-right businessman in Quebec politics. And uh, turns out to, he wasn't a, a very natural politician in his career there. It didn't uh, last long. Um, but yeah, it says that... Uh, Pelado said that uh, the industry minister must intervene because Lavras is favoring commercial interests, uh, its own commercial interests over the consumer interest, and that measures need to be taken to preserve an environment of fair competition. Uh, the mobile branch of Lavra says their kiosks represent less than 5% of sales in mobile phones and plans in Canada, and that the deal does absolutely nothing to competition. So basically, Lavra is going, ah, come on, guys, don't worry about it. It's only 5%. <laughs> yeah, but only five percent. Loblaws is one of the biggest chains in Canada. Like I think it's like eighty percent of the country lives within like a few kilometers of a Loblaws brand. All the brands, no frills and whatnot, store. So now these are the kiosks; they're not the brands. But Loblaws reached when Loblaws says it's just five percent because of sales in mobile phones. Um, that's a lot. For a company like mobile, like Freedom Mobile, which is one of the smaller players, um, so yeah, uh, we'll see what uh, what is the case. Uh, the industry minister François Philippe Champagne has repeatedly said that he does want to see increased competition, uh, but as we um, in Canada, this seems to um, be something that is very difficult to achieve specifically when it comes to cell companies because we get these new smaller players in the market and it turns out that they're affiliated with one of the big players anyway uh, or they soon get gobbled up, right? Which is a, a bit of a, a tougher situation for us uh, who are looking for more competition uh, in the sector. All right, what else do we have today here in the chat for you? Okay, yes. Oh, speaking of Loblaws, uh, Loblaws has stated that, um, well, basically the boycott has been having the intended and desired impact. So we mentioned at the beginning that uh, when it was announced, uh, they didn't, uh, well, the government wanted to have a grocery, grocer's food of uh, Food of contact, code of conduct. I'm thinking I'm so hungry right now. <laughs> code of conduct. Uh, and then uh, the grocers balked at that, saying, Well, we don't want to sign on to this voluntary code of conduct because we believe that this conduct will do the opposite of what it is that you want it to do. It will raise prices rather than lower prices. And then they resisted and they resisted. And then um, they pulled that move where they uh, their discounted products, meats and stuff like that, uh, instead of offering them 50% off, 30% off, this is what they did. And then the public reacted and that didn't go well for them. And then they reversed themselves on that. And then someone started to call for a boycott. And then you had the head of uh, Loblaws, not Galen Weston, but Perbunk, uh, 
uh, turning around going, knock, knock, enough is enough. Don't do that. It's like, how dare you hold us responsible and demand some accountability? Us poor grocers, we've done so much already. Enough is enough. Stop crucifying us and trying to tarnish our reputation. And that didn't go over well because uh, it became a meme. <laughs> and then the pressure maintained. And it seems that uh, according to polling, uh, Canadians are reporting that two out of five of us are indeed uh, participating in the boycott. Um, so uh, that has led to Loblaws determining that, uh, yeah, you know what? Um, maybe we will sign on to that code of conduct um, voluntarily after all. Uh, now, as an undercurrent to all of that, um, around December 18th, 2023, uh, Agriculture Minister Lawrence McCauley had mentioned that uh, specifically, that if the grocers weren't willing to come on willingly to sign on to a code of conduct, that the government would be forced to legislate that. And that was always an undercurrent. So the combination of the prospect of legislation along with the boycott sort of brought Loblaws along. But now uh, that they are agreeing to sign to the Code of Conduct, uh, the new position from these CEOs are, well, Listen, 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 listen. I know we tried to pretend that there was nothing wrong, and then I, um, I know that we resisted, and I know that we thought we could get away with resisting, uh, but you know what? It's not working. So, uh, yeah, we're going to sign on, and uh, if we do sign on, well, yeah, um, you really don't need to make that law now, do you? It seems the CEOs are very, 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 very frightened all of a sudden of um, the code of conduct becoming law. According to Davis Legree in iPolitics, quote, Lobla's decision to sign the grocery code of conduct suggests the policy can be implemented without government legislation, according to the chair of the board of directors responsible for developing the code. The federal government endorsed the idea of a code with standards guiding interactions between retailers and suppliers earlier last year, but progress stalled after several years of industry-led discussions failed to secure the backing of all five of Canadians' major grocers. That would be Loblaw, Walmart, Costco, Metro, and Empire. This led Agricultural Minister Lawrence McCauley, McCauley to publicly muse, as I mentioned, about legislating the code should the grocery sector fail to voluntarily adopt the policy. Quote, we've indicated that all measures are on the table, Macaulay told iPolitics last December. How we want to proceed, it's yet to be decided, but all measures are on the table, including possibly legislation. However, Michael Graydon, the CEO of Food, Health, and Consumer Products of Canada, is increasingly hopeful that legislation will not be necessary, as evidenced by Lobla's decision to come on board last week. After holding out for several months, citing a belief that the code will increase food prices, Loblaws announced it would commit to the code joining Metro and Empire, owner of Sobeys, Foodland, Farm Boy, etc., Quote, it's a step in the right direction, Industry Minister François-Philippe Champagne said Wednesday morning. If you talk to the independent grocers of Canada, the code is one of the key steps to stabilize food prices in Canada. And as we mentioned yesterday, over the last three years, food prices have gone up over 20%. So we're going to keep working, and I'm hopeful that all the major grocers will sign on, said Philippe Champagne. It should be noted that Loblaw's decision came in the middle of a month-long nationwide boycott of the chain organized in protest of skyrocketing food prices. However, Graydon told iPolitics in an interview the board was approached by Canada's largest grocer, quote, a number of months ago. Loblaw's reached out to the code board and said they would like to engage in some conversations around the code, said Graydon, adding that the food retailing giant requested several revisions, quote, to create more clarity and prescriptiveness. These changes included clarifying that pricing disputes between retailers and suppliers would not be eligible for third party adjudication, and further detailing relationships between forecasts and orders. After Metro and Empire agreed to the revisions, Loblaw signed on, leaving Walmart and Costco as the only grocers yet to commit. 
During an appearance before the House Agricultural Committee earlier this year, Costco executive Pierre Riel said he supports the general principles and respecting suppliers and consumers, but had no specifics on what a code would actually entail. Quote, Costco is reviewing the revised document, said Graydon, but it seems to me in conversations we're having with Costco, it's around more clarity, so I'm hopeful they'll come aboard. Meanwhile, Walmart has never expressed any degree of support for a code of conduct, but Graydon is optimistic that Loblaw joining could be the domino that brings Walmart aboard as well. Walmart received the revised documents last Wednesday, he said, so there's a lot of paperwork to go through. After Loblaw's announcement last week, several online petitions receiving thousands of signatures have called on Walmart to endorse the code. Graydon said the board was yet to, quote, draw a line in the sand regarding a deadline for Walmart to commit, but said he believes the chain will be receptive to the changes made at the request of Loblaw. Quote, it's very difficult to get a sense of exactly what their concerns are, said Graydon, but I would have to expect they would likely be quite similar to Loblaw's, so I'm hopeful that the changes that we've been able to make with Loblaw's will accommodate Walmart. We're being respectful of the time they need to review the documents, and we will likely hear from them sooner rather than later. Graydon noted that Walmart may be motivated to engage after the federal government's threats to impose legislation, considering all retailers, quote, would rather be in complete control. The best solution is for the industry to manage this on a voluntary basis, he said. The federal agricultural ministry also confirmed it's the government's preference for the code to remain industry-led, saying in a statement that, quote, uniting all supply chain partners around the shared principles of fairness, transparency, and predictability in the grocery store and supply chain would yield the best outcomes for the sector and Canadians. It's well past time that all major retailers, including Walmart, joined the code. In the meantime, we continue to examine all of our options at the federal level. Costco did not respond to iPolitics' request for comment, while a spokesperson for Walmart said there's been no update since the company received the revised draft. So there you go. Uh, so it seems that, uh, based on this, everybody, including the government, would be much happier if they did not have to legislate this. But I think it's kind of interesting that... Uh, a little bit of public pressure and a threat of legislation uh, is enough to make a corporate giant like Loblaw say, "Okay, okay, 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 yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll 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 sign it, but pl- pl- but please, please don't make it law." Hmm. Very, very, very interesting. Hmm. In other news, um, the Conservative Party of Canada is angry again. Oh, and uh, the reason here is uh, actually interesting. It would seem that uh, Canada's upper house, and this is according to uh, the Canadian press, has adopted a new set of rules that the liberal government says will further entrench its independence as the dominoes from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's Senate reforms continue to fall. The large majority of senators voted in favor of the sweeping changes earlier this month. But the Conservatives, whose numbers have dwindled down to just 13 seats, the Conservative, so basically when the Prime Minister uh, freed the Senators in the Senate to not be politically affiliated with the federal parties and that they could organize themselves however they wanted, uh, the Conservative Party uh, said no and resisted this and said, uh, no, we're going to continue being a party. And uh, while now out of the hundred or so seats in the Senate, uh, only 13 of them are held by senators that consider themselves still members of the Conservative Party of Canada. So this is a bit of a rage against the dying of the light kind of thing. Uh, But it seems that uh, the senators themselves, most of them, um, really, 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 really like the change. The change was good and they want to solidify it. So, uh, and improve upon it, so they've uh, made some rule changes. The new rule changes give more power to each of the groups recognized by the Senate modernization legislation that Parliament passed in 2022. Rather than mimicking the dual roles of government and opposition in the House of Commons, the Senate now gives additional groups similar powers and additional speaking time during debates. The leaders of recognized groups, three of which now outnumber the Tories, can now defer votes on conservatives and sit on committees to question witnesses. It means less time for the official opposition to give speeches and pose questions. In Westminster Parliament, the government's role is to propose things. The opposition's role is to challenge the government, said Conservative Senator Denise Batters. What is the role of these other groups? Senator Pierre Trinquet, a former Liberal MP who was appointed by Prime Minister Jacques Chrétien, now sits in the Independent Senators Group, said nothing has changed for the Conservatives. Quote, They have not lost any power, she says. They have the same political tools at their disposal, she said. It's just that the other groups now have access to those too. 
Senator Scott Tanis, who was a conservative senator and now leads the Canadian Senators Group, said he thinks the rule changes are a necessary evolution. Quote, There will be multiple groups in the Senate for a long time to come, not just government and opposition, he said. Greater independence from political parties and House of Common colleagues has led to better alignment and productivity, he argued. Quote, since about 2015, about 27% of the legislation of the government has been amended by the Senate versus 7% in the previous era. So the change has, and removing the partisanship, has actually allowed the Senate to actually fulfill its main function of providing sober second thought. Again, I will repeat, since 2015, about 27% of the legislation of the government has been amended by the Senate versus 7% in the previous era. It was a good change. It was a good change. Tanas added that he doesn't think that he'll use his newfound powers very often. The leader of the third newer entity, the Progressive Senate Group, said the rule changes will prevent future conservative governments from reversing course on the reforms that have been reshaping the institution. And it's only fair for larger groups to have equal ability to fulfill their duties as senators, said Senator Pierre Dalfon. If there's a time where the opposition wants to defer a vote, they will not hesitate to do it, he said. But if somebody else defers a vote, this is bad? I don't understand. Earlier in his tenure as liberal leader, Trudeau kicked liberal senators out of his caucus. As prime minister, he instituted a new process to appoint senators. Rather than choosing straight-up partisans, he approves the membership of an independent board and takes their advice on appointees, a process that the conservatives have argued nonetheless yielded a crop of senators who lean progressive. Only three senators now hold roles affiliated with government. The main representative, Senator Mark Gold, who forced a vote on the rule changes, his deputy, and a third senator described as a government liaison. In part because former Prime Minister Stephen Harper left a large number of Senate seats vacant at the end of his tenure, and in part due to the mandatory retirement age for senators, conservative numbers have dwindled. Even if the conservatives win a federal election and control the House of Commons, it could take a very long time before partisan conservatives have a majority in the Senate. And uh, this uh, little note, uh, uh, Kits and Cubs, is particularly important when uh, Pierre Poliev is talking about uh, invoking the notwithstanding clause to, to suspend rights. Um, if he does attempt to do that, he does have to try to get it through the Senate. I'm going to guess, given the way that the senators seem to be enjoying their newfound independence, and that more of them are choosing to amend legislation. Um, good luck with that. I think that uh, PP's desire to curtail our constitutional rights while using the notwithstanding clause may receive much objection in the Senate and resistance. Um, so, um, although they could, although the Conservatives could propose their own rule changes, it's unclear whether the Senate in its modern composition would support them. There were not many rules the opposition could agree with the rest of the chamber on, but after significant debate, most agreed on a few, including that unelected senators still living down the expensive scandals of yore gave themselves a shorter dinner break. <laughs> Literally, they're debating about dinner breaks. Oh my word. <sighs> These people. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, just, uh, you know, when we mentioned on the show, uh, you know, what has the prime minister done? Like, and we mentioned, you know, if you actually sit down and think about it, uh, this current prime minister has actually been rather transformative. This is one of the ways. This is definitely one of the ways. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, we have you for a couple of moments. So do you have anything while we have you here? Uh, no, not really. Uh, unfortunately, I am going to have to jump off now. I've got a f number of things I have to take care of here. There's no way I can provide you with the attention that you require uh, or, or the kids and cubs deserve. So uh, I do apologize. But uh, duty does call, and uh, we are hitting the 8.30 mark, which is when we'd usually wrap up anyway. I realize it was a late start. Apologies uh, between timing, technology, and life schedules. Sometimes things don't go according to plan. This is one of those days. So yep. I, 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 we're going to we're gonna have to shut it off now because I, I won't be able to come back at any point um, for a number of hours. All right. So I apologize. Uh, that's just... You know, sometimes that's how life rolls. Hey, 
you did what was needed to done so we could actually get one in, Mr. Grizzly. So we, uh, we really, really thank you. And the kids are saying that don't apologize for life. No worries. So kids and cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. The QR code under my chin, that's brought to you courtesy of the Ray Girl. And that will bring you to our pod page, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And when you click subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, we will come directly to you. Uh, three new episodes just uploaded this morning. Uh, for people who are uh, looking on a podcast version, we are a little bit behind still, uh, but we hope to get uh, ca- caught up on that uh, now that I'm back to regular and normal life. Uh, if you would like to get a little beaver in your life, go to our Etsy store or our merch store. That's at, uh, if you scan that QR code, and that's at etsy.com slash CA slash shop slash T-N-E-B merch store and uh anything that you would like uh you can get there and uh yes appreciate everybody who supported us there uh already um if you would like to support us in other ways make like elaine and go to the true north eager beaver youtube page and uh, click our buttons smash those buttons before you leave like share subscribe we thank you for that and if you'd like to help us in another way the qr code by mr grizzly's head brings you to our tip jar at our coffee page that's coffee ko-fi.com slash eager beaver lowercase letters all in one word if uh, you have a, a little bit of change there and would like to help us uh, and encourage us to do more thank you so much uh, please leave it there uh, because democracy is something that you do if you're in alberta get involved if you are in a new brunswick saskatchewan and british columbia you have uh, provincial elections coming on. Do get involved. Um, thank you to our podcast founding sponsors. True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com is where you write us. If you're listening on Apple, stars and reviews are appreciated. Uh, it's a tough world out there, so please be kind to and uh, gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, a uh, quick word of wisdom. Uh, one day at a time. One day at a time. One day at a time. All right. Uh, we won't come back with an Easter egg so that Mr. Grizzly can go. And uh, Kits and Cubs, if you are on our website and whatnot, uh, we have uh, final four designs uh, from uh, Pete for the Mental Health Walk. If you can uh, let us know what it is that you prefer, uh, we would really, really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, and I'll try to put a link to it in the chat before we go. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, please cue the cock. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. <laughs>